Um, these are some of the devices, you don't need any reminding about some of these things, but some of the, the, the devices that are being used, the people who I was speaking to and what they were doing, collecting photographs, monitoring the miles they were running, they were walking, the steps they were taking, and these kind of things, heart rate monitors. Just to give you a brief example of, of some of the issues, or the, the devices that are involved. Um, and then the, the platforms that were being used, and some of these people were experimenting in what they were doing. So some of the templates that were, were there, the devices that they were being used, weren't what they were after. So they were experimenting in how they were collecting, and they were pushing you know, certain agendas. Some of them were as simple as spreadsheets. Some of them were pens and papers. But what all of them did do is digitize it. They put it online in some way, or they put it through the computer in, in some way. And that's the kind of the, the linkage there, I suppose. In some, and you know, mobile phones were used, map my runs, people being creative. Now, this is not somebody I spoke to, but you know, how some of this stuff was being represented uh, in what they were doing. So th the questions I had with this, when I, went, when I started off this, the, the two big questions I had was, why people are doing this? What motivates them to collect the information? And then also, their appreciations of, the, of the, the, the data they were collecting. What kind of values do they have in relation to it? And what kind of values do they perceive other people to have in it? And how do they understand some of those dilemmas? Yeah? Um, so the, the, my kind of starting point, be, before I kind of went anywhere near uh, anybody who was doing QS, and this is all in relation to QS, a bit like the meetups that we heard about earlier on, um, was to kind of familiar myself, familiarize myself with the, the the, or the, the literature that's out there. And most of the stuff revolves around, it, it should give you a flavour of where I'm coming from with all of this. And what I was looking at is things like better, betterment through, you know, and improvement through the numbers, as we all commonly associate with QS. Then things like self-hacking, breaking into your own information, analysing your own information in whatever ways you want to do. Um, then also the, the idea of a voluntary contribution. Often, Nobody's holding a gun to anybody's head here, and people are, are giving over a lot of information about various things. Um, I'm trying to get a handle on why people are doing some of those things. Um, and then, okay, neoliberalism comes into it as well. The, the economic models evolved around some of these things and how things are incentivized, how people do what they do, and also the kind of self responsabilization particularly in relation to kind of health situations, where, so for instance, diabetics, rather than going to a hospital and having themselves monitored, what they're doing is they're monitoring themselves at home and that kind of thing. Um, and then lastly, the objectification of data, where the data is actually the be-all and end-all, and that is, is, is new to me, and thanks for that today. Um, but that kind of idea, where the emphasis is put on the data rather than the activity that's involved around it. So that was kind of flavoring my initial kind of fall into QS and, and, and trying to get a handle on what was going on there. Um, and as I said, uh, what I'm interested in is the users, yeah? And I quite like this. And you might recognize yourself in some of these uh, different uh, kind of categories, yeah? But Sewell talks about the different types of users, uh, QS type users, yeah? And the guinea pigs are those, the, you know, the top end athletes, those people that want to shave 0 0.0001 of a second off their performance, the ones who you know, are quite quick to uh, take on board some of the new uh, technologies that are coming out. Then we have people for health reasons, like as we mentioned, people I came across, people are suffering from cancer and they're monitoring certain uh, categories of their treatment or of the response of their bodies to this treatment and using it in helping and bettering their, themselves in, in health ways. Um, and then also the improvement, people who are training for a marathon, we'll say, and um, keeping tabs on what they're doing, how fast they're going, how long they're going, how they can move forward with some of these things. Um, and then lastly, which is cropped up uh, earlier on, is the techno-driven. Those people who, for instance, are sitting home at night, they've set themselves a task of 10,000 steps per day, they've only got to 8,000, and all of a sudden they think, oh God, I better go out and run around the block, or they may cheat and, and shake it till they get to that 10,000 mark. Um, and then lastly, those ones who are curious, and these generally evolve around things like getting a birthday present of a, a Fitbit, using it for a while, seeing, you know, experimenting with it, seeing how it goes. And interesting, in some of the uh, previous, or other work I was looking at, some of the other literatures, it talks about failure in these things and how these people take on these devices just for a short period and then leave them. But arguing that it's actually not a failure, even for using it for that short period of time, there's still a certain amount of success that goes with that. 
So that's kind of flavoured my approach to it. Now, but what I'm kind of interested in is some of the kind of non-beneficial aspects to it are some of the kind of the media stories that have been revolving around this that have suggested that you know there is there's a slightly darker side to collecting some of this information and these are some of the headlines that i dug up and and they revolve around a lot of this is the u.s context of course uh, in relation to, to health insurance and what have you there um, and things like health insurance companies plugging into exactly what you're doing monitoring the information that you're providing and offering premiums in relation to that. If you're very healthy and you haven't got any health issues, you get a slightly cheaper premium and so on. Things also as well like leakage. So you have your device, you've run your miles, you're sending it over to the platform, wherever it is. A certain amount of leakage goes on there, a certain amount of potential to hack into some of this information. Um, and then also the, the kind of economic side of things. So here we have the CEO, Jawbone, and he's arguing that, uh, well, certainly stating that it's not really about the devices. That's not where the money is. The money is in the information that's being produced. Um, and you know, it's, that's kind of key to some of the understandings that are going on around this. And then lastly, you know, information is being sold. Uh, it's plain and simple. It, companies are selling the information on. Um, some other headlines. The, uh, some, some businesses in the States who are uh, asking their staff to wear, for instance, Fitbits, um, to monitor their activities, to monitor what they're doing, and also in relation to some of those health premiums and health insurance and what's going on there. Then the, in relation also to sex, is it like Deborah Lupton has, has written a lot about this kind of stuff, how the promotion of this, and in particular, you know, the kind of gender differences there. So men, it's usually better performance, the longevity, the amount of partners they have, the amount of positions they have, goes online and kind of in a boastful kind of way. Women are probably more likely to, to record menstrual cycles or uh, fertility cycles and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then lastly, the, it's now, there's been a number of cases where some of this information has appeared in court. So there was a case in Canada where somebody was accused of murder. They said they were in a certain place, but in fact they were in another place, and the, the, the Fitbit information was able to prove that. It's also been used more recently in the UK, disability benefits, people who were claiming disability, but in fact were training for a marathon, and the information was used to prove that. Yeah. So, so these are some of the, the, the other aspects of QS and how that information is being used. The privacy, so this is the, the kind of the big area that I'm interested in, is the privacy around this information, yeah? So this is the terms and conditions from Fitbit, you know, the small print, yeah? So I went through the small print, and this, it may be updated, but this is somewhere from like last December, I think is when I looked it up. It starts off with three kind of core values, the third core, and now I've underlined these bits, the, the, the third core value is, we will never sell you data, they say. You keep going down, you go down a bit more, they say, we may sell your data, but it'll be aggregated, it'll be anonymized, your name won't appear anywhere. And then you scroll down a bit more, we will sell your PII, your personal identifiable information, or sorry, it can be sold. Now there is a caveat to this, in that they say that, well, if we sell it, we'll be selling to another company, we will ask that other company to, to comply with data protection laws and, and so on and so forth. But it, there's a bit of a mixed message going on there. Um, and as Lucas was talking about earlier on with Strava, yeah, a lot of this stuff is observable. It's, it's open, yeah? It's open knowledge. And I want to give an example here is my, uh, Map My Run, yeah? And if we can get this to go. So some of these things are password protected. This one isn't. So this one is, I was sitting in my office and I just said, how close can I get a map around here, yeah? So what I do is I simply went on to map my room, went in, had a look. Here we have, this is the first name that came up, Sarah. If I click on that, we get a little picture of Sarah, see who she is, yeah? It's quite open about what she's doing. Um, and also, if I go back to the other one, down a bit, we get a little video of our run. Now, to me, this is it's quite intimate detail. The time, the place, where she went, well, as this loads up, will give you a very detailed view of the streets she ran, yeah? As it, as it goes. And the kind of pace she was running. Did I hit the right one? Let's try it again. Hold on. It's not running, but it, it does give a quite a detailed look of the actual road she was on and, and 
even what side of the road she was on as she was running. It does zoom in the only but anyway, all right, let's leave that and but yeah, the the point being how intimate some of this information is and how freely available this information is and how people the potential to use it in various ways are, are there. So to make sense of all of this, um, and what I wanted to try and do is kind of use, there's a thing called communication privacy management, and use that to make sense of how privacy is being understood by some of the people who are using this in relation to the data that they're producing. Yeah? Um, and Petrionio uh, suggests that there, there's, what, they talk, what she talks about is a, a boundary metaphor. So the boundary metaphor relates to privacy. So you have the, the boundary further out, further in, depending on the kind of context that's involved. And some of these contexts are things like culture. So for instance, in some cultures, it's commonly, you know, it, it's not, it wouldn't be unusual for somebody just to walk in and sit at the kitchen table of a stranger's house and start chatting. That's a, other cultures, you have to arrange exactly the time and the date you're going to appear. So there's some, there, there is discrepancies there in how people understand privacy, yeah? Also, gender, in relation to how gender, you know, quite often there's been some recent work that's looked at Facebook, which suggests that women lie more on Facebook, whereas men talk about themselves less on Facebook. So there are some discrepancies in what's been disclosed there. And once again, it's this boundary, yeah? the privacy boundary, how far close it's going to the person. Um, and then motivations. So for instance, in examples where a couple may be splitting up or divorcing, emotions are high. What's being disclosed is often a little bit more than it normally would be, describing the in intimate details of a certain person, and it pushes that boundary out. Yeah? So that can sometimes affect how, it's, how it plays out. Then there's also the idea of contextual. So if you're in an environment that you feel safe in, you're inclined to kind of reveal slightly more. So you're pushing that privacy boundary out a little bit more again. So if you're in a password protected environment, maybe you feel slightly safer there, and you will push that boundary out a little bit. Um, and then lastly is the kind of the risk benefit ratio. And what they mean here is, you know, I tell you something intimate, you tell me something intimate, I give you a bit of information, you give me information, and it strengthens the bonds of the relationship, yeah, and kind of moves that onto an, another level to some degree. And also, there is kind of rules and regulations around this. You know, if you break that, there are consequences. You know, you've disclosed personal information that I gave to you, and, and, and it can all quite quickly fall apart in that relationship, yeah. So that's the kind of where I'm coming from, or you know, the, the kind of theoretical, I suppose, grounding of what I'm trying to do here. What I did, be like yourself, is I went to the QS meetings in London, um, and attended a few. But what what I most of my ana analysis was in relation to the videos were being put online. And what, just like yours, there was three questions, what you did, how you did it, how you got on. People spoke for 10 minutes, there was 10 minutes of questions. Usually three people spoke per meeting. But all, when I looked at it, it was 64 videos. They've, they've all been put up online. I sat through them all, had a look at it all, and narrowed it down to 10, I transcribed those 10, had a look at some of the issues that were going on there. But none of them really spoke about privacy, and I wanted to kind of push that a bit more to see you know, their feelings and understandings about the, the value of this information they're creating. Yeah? Um, so what I did is I interviewed five of these people that were uh, in these videos, but I also wanted to look at a kind of a more sort of amateurish side of things. So what I did was I looked at five people who had been basically QSing for at least six months, had continuous data for six months. So they were amateurish, but they were relatively seasoned in what they were doing, a relatively practice in what they were doing. Yeah? Um, I've also done a number of focus groups, but I'm not going to discuss them here today. But these 10 interviews is what kind of generates what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and the findings on what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to split them up into two. Kind of some, have a look at some of the motivations about what people do, um, and I'll also have a look about some of the pri privacy aspects of, of what people talked about in these interviews. Yeah? So the, 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 the first one in relation to motivation. And this person talks about it instills better behaviours in her. And that's why she does it. Now this person's kind of story is that she grew up in, as she described it, a chaotic household. There was no real rules there. So what QS to her does, it's almost like a disciplining 
strategy, her disciplining format and what she does. It allows her to make sense of what she's doing. It allows her to set goals for herself. So what she does is she sets tasks for herself. And if she hits four or five of those tasks, then she gives herself a little reward. And it allows her to structure how she lives her life and how she kind of makes sense of her life. Okay? This one is more he had a problem and he wanted to solve that problem, see what it was. And he kind of correlated some of his stuff. But interesting, he starts off with what, what gets measured gets managed. And yeah, that's how he kind of makes sense of it. But in his case, he was trying to figure out what was happening when he was buying so much coffee and what he was buying. And it, as he said, it was making me feel shit. And that's what he wanted to discover. So he discovered he was drinking too much coffee, he was eating too much cake, and then he came to the realisation that's why he felt shit and that's why he stopped doing it. Yeah. Um, this guy is in relation to, he was uh, asthmatic, um, and a bit, a bit like the, the, the neoliberal example, he, um, he was collecting the information at home, he was uh, then bringing it into the hospital, and the hospital was quite quickly you know, making decisions, okay, you're using your inhaler too often or too little, and he found that extremely helpful. And kind of cutting to the chase when he went into the hospital, being able to produce the information in the hospital, and then being able to make decisions quite quickly, and in a quite detailed manner of his use and what he could do to improve it or less, you know, lessen the amount of uh, inhaler use he was doing. Um, also within the motivations, and I think what's, it has been kind of discussed a little bit here, but for me, I think what is key to all of this is fun, the fun aspect of it. That's why a lot of people do this stuff, because they find it quite fun. Uh, and in this case, this is somebody who works all around the world, she's, she's in different places at different times, um, what she does is she maps or runs when she's get there. She shows that her friends can have a look at it there online. And there's a kind of a cool element to it. Oh, this week I was in Vancouver. I ran around the Rockies. I did this, that, and the other. Her friend then may have been in Venice. I ran in Venice. This is what I did. And there's a kind of there's a slight competitive element to it, but there's also an element of showing off of what they were doing or kind of bragging about what they were doing, um, which which adds which is what she enjoys about the whole aspect of it. Yeah. But also as well as an, an amount an amount of exposure in what she's doing, which she, she was quite happy with. Yeah? Um, so jumping now to, to, to privacy um, and what people do and how people kind of make sense of what they do. And, and this person wasn't unique in any way. Most people say, I, I share everything. And in this case, it's a kind of, it's almost like a memory tool. Yeah? It helps her remember what happened. Now this person is a blogger. She uh, writes about food. Um, and she reviews restaurants and coffee shops and things like that. So she finds it very helpful to keep a record of all these things, keep it out in the public knowledge because people are, are having a look at her reviews, but also it's a trigger when she goes back, oh God, I've been in that coffee shop before, what did I think of it? She goes back in, has a look, okay, I was there January 25th, I had a coffee and I had a cake and da -da 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 -da. I thought it was quite good. And that's how she uses it and that's how she makes a sense of it and that's where the value in the information is to her. Um, in this one, he doesn't mind people seeing data. But then when I said, well, what about, you know, we have evidence here that people are, are actually, the companies are selling the information. And when he heard that, he said, well, that would piss me off. So what he was, he was all right with information being sold. Or so he was all right with giving information. But when it was his information was being sold on, that's when he had an issue with it. And that's when he felt slightly uncomfortable with it. Now, he did say, you know, if it's anonymized, he's all right, but he doesn't mind about it. But he still, he, there's a tension there and what he's, what he's suggesting. In this one, my data is private. He starts off with a very clear statement. My data is private, yeah, I'm in charge of my data. However, there's nothing compromising in it either. Yeah? So I can let it go out there, I don't really mind because it's of no real value, but my data is private. Which it seems quite odd, but there's also, there's kind of an altruistic sense within this one. It's for the greater good. It'll go out there into the big bad world for the greater good, yeah? Which kind of continues into the next one. So this one is a little bit more explicit about kind of the altruistic nature of all this. My information could be used to plot the amount of 41 to 50 year old London guys living in a certain place, doing certain kind of activities and, and, and what their health benefits may be. However, both of these and anybody that raised this, I asked them about, well, did you sign up for that? They're like, oh, no, no. So there's a presumption made that this will be used for the greater good. 
Nobody has said, stated anywhere, as far as they were aware, that their information will be used in a kind of a big data sense or in promotion of health benefits within a certain area. So they presume it will be. They presume their information will be altruistic in some way. Equally, there's a certain kind of expectation that companies will sell the information on. Once again, a kind of presumption, because when they're pressed on this, people don't say, oh yeah, well I signed up to have my information sent away. Now they probably tick the box, you know, when you, when you agree to the terms and conditions, but nobody I had talked to had read that or understood the value of their data and what is actually happening to the data. So two kind of interesting presumptions in what people are doing with their things. So to come bring it back to privacy management, yeah, to try and make sense of some of these things. The cultural aspect of it, you know, there, there, there certainly is a value in the immediate. Yeah, people run their miles, they come home, they have a quick look at their garment. Okay, I've burned this amount of calories, I've run that far, I've run up that high, whatever, this is my new personal best. So there's a huge value in that, and that's quite often why people use this and why, what promotes them to do some of these things. As I said before, there's also an expectation that you know, there is going to be, companies will be making profit out of it. There is an expectation that it will be used for big data or will be used in some altruistic way, which is, uh, to me is really unusual. But there's also as well, I think, a real, particularly in, in sort of a, a Western European culture, predisposition to share, to share online, to get our information out there, to kind of show we're alive, to show we're doing this, that and the other. And this is just another form of that, yeah? Um, for good or bad, you know, uh, th there's benefits to these things and there are kind of so the dark side of these things, if you want to call it that. But definitely there is a predisposition now to do that, particularly in younger generations. The gender difference, uh, I didn't find any. You know, the, the, for me, from what I was looking at, the, there was no differences really. <coughs> um, the motivation with all of this is clearly, you know, the betterment through numbers, knowing yourself slightly better, running further, you know, knowing your, your asthma intakes slightly better and, and so on and so forth. And that's, you know, a clear reason why people do it. Also, as well, there's that, you know, going back to that kind of fun element, uh, you know, that, that brag it on, you know, kind of as Quillman talks about, you can show where you've been, you can show off certain things, yeah? Um, and then there's a kind of the contextual as well. You know, you, you arrive somewhere and there's information that's on there. There's information that's on there that's freely available. Like when I looked at the map my run, if I was new to, to Birmingham, I could suddenly find out, okay, I'm thinking of going for a run. Where could be a good run to go? I can go on there. I can get some sort of information out of that. But there's also kind of limits in some of these contexts as well. As some of those I spoke to wanted to get a hold of their own information, to analyze their own information in certain ways, but they would only be given the, you know, the templates that these organizations or these companies provided. They wouldn't give them anything more. And some of them did push them on it and say, okay, well, I have my calories, I have my distances, I have my times, but actually, you know what? I want to look at something different. I want to look at something in slightly more detail. And the companies weren't willing to provide that. Of those I spoke to, there was probably three or four of them who asked for extra information and they didn't get it yet. They just got the standard information back. So that there is kind of tensions around that as well. And then the risk-based thing, you know, the kind of some of the, the trade-offs involved here. People are quite happy for their information to be used in ways known and ways unknown. They see some of the benefits of, it, of the, the immediacy of finding out what they have. And if it's being used, that's all they're really interested in. If it's being used for other ways and means, so be it. Even though some people may, may have been pissed off, as in they're not getting money back for it, yes, as the, the participants suggested. But it, it seems to be a r relatively accepted way of doing these things. Um, and then just to kind of some sort of concluding thoughts and all of this. Um, there's, it, there's value within the information. People don't seem to mind sharing that. You know, that, that will be my conclusion of those I spoke to. The, certainly from the 10 people I spoke to and some of the focus groups I've done, people are quite happy to, set, to let this information go or trade it or move it on. The, the boundaries, the boundaries still exist. When pe you ask anybody about the information they put online, health information and financial information are sacrosanct. Those boundaries are kept very close. However, health does cross over into some of these things. And people do, depending on the context they're in, they do let that boundary go out a little bit more. And in situations where they may be highly emotive situations, you know, somebody had an asthma attack and they wanted to score, you know, th that the boundary comes out a little bit further, yeah? So th there is some movement within that boundary. Key to all of this is the sensitivity around some of these things. Um, and 
I come from a, my background is kind of surveillance studies and looking at issues around surveillance. And quite often, things come to a loggerhead when somebody hits a brick wall. When some sort of ac access has been compromised, that's when the issue flares up. And in these situations, this information, particularly in the US context, where it's going to limit premiums to health insurance and things like that, that's when this thing could flare up or possibly is flaring up, particularly in the US context. I think it, you know, in Western Europe, we're kind of isolated from some of those contexts, but you know, things may change. Um, particularly in, in the UK, the NHS, I'm, I'd be, uh, it's on a slippery slope at the moment, I think. But anyway, um, the, 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 there is, you know, the value is in getting the information, how many rials you've run, how fit you are, what you've kind of done. Um, the tensions maybe as well around some of the kind of issues around the big data, as we talked about, that uh, altruistic sense. Where is that coming from? Why do people think that? Why do people presume that? We have some sort of evidence to suggest that it is going down the direction of companies are selling the information, yeah? But this other one seems to be a, a, a kind of a, a presumption that this is strange. Um, making money and exclusion, you know, there are some of the issues that are evolving around this. Um, also, and, you know, forever present is, you know, the exposure of compromising data. And I don't really want to go down that route because I do think there's an element here of security fatigue, particularly in relation to some of these things, in that if there's not an immediate effect to these things, people's guards get, and they get a bit sick of it. Oh, you must have a password effect. You must do this, you must do that. Um, and if there's no instant repercussion to some of these things, people become a bit blasé to these things. And, uh, you know, as a person, there's nothing compromising in his data. And to some degree, there isn't. Yeah? So I, I don't think we should need to get too caught up in all of this kind of thing. But, you know, th this is something that's not going away. Now, I've, I went with a conservative. I know you said 9.2 billion by 2020. I went with the very conservative, we've said two billion in the one I looked at. Um, but you know, this is an industry that's here for the, the long term, I, I would imagine, and how it's going to develop and move on. Because quite quickly, the market will be saturated with devices, or new devices will come on. But the emphasis will be on the data, will be on what's being collected there, how that can be maximized and what people are going to do. Um, and I want to finish with one last kind of example of all of this. Last year's Tour de France. Chris Froome was leading at the time. There was accusations of he, he was doping. Um, now, this is kind of QS at the top end, yeah? But what they said they do is they would release his data, they, you know, the, the energy he was generating on the bike, the amount of revs, he was, the, the wheels were going around, and so on and so forth. But it was sensitive data because his opponents, if they got their hands on that um, information, they could have very insightful knowledge of exactly what he was doing. So they edited it, the information, and they did release it to prove that he wasn't doping at the time. But that just shows at the top end how kind of sensitive some of this data can be. It can be equally sensitive when it's related to us, particularly when it compromises some of the decisions we may be making in future dates. 